How you doing, Michael? Ah, great. Great afternoon today. Good, good. So today we put out um, a clip today addressing um, cooperation. I would like to expand on that discussion um, and ask you a few other questions um, about some things that we've talked about personally. Don't be afraid. Ask. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm ready for anything. <laughs> almost, right. almost anything you ask. One of the most interesting, um, and I'll be honest, you kind of changed my mind to a certain extent. Um, we talked before about, you know, I have a probably a more outsider's perspective. Like, God damn it, these guys turned on you. These guys did this. And then, you know, one day you said something to me about, um, you said, um, RJ, there's a lot of collateral damage that comes along with cooperation. It's not just, um, you know, the person that you're mad at that's affected. So I want you to kind of, you know, I'll let you speak to that in your own words. So can you kind of explain what that means, collateral damage that's associated with co uh, with cooperation? Okay. The, the people you're involved with the life with understand the life and understand that you could get hurt by cooperators or, or your own peers and with violence. Okay. Let's put that on the side right now. When a person like me cooperates, we're involved, intertwined with families, wives, kids. We baptize them. Uh, we confirm them. Uh, we go out to dinner. We all kiss. We hug. We swim in pools. We go on vacations. Uh, so in my position, in, in my mindset, these are the things that bothered me. Because my whole life, I hated rats. Who wanted to be associated with a rat? I become what I hate. So that doesn't wash away all my history and all the relationships I had with people, even the people I didn't. You know, if I seen a, another wise guy's wife or daughter or family member somewhere, and well, we're just casual, I just know who they were. If they seen them in a problem, my job, because that's my family, even though I don't know them that well, that's my family. Their extended family, my brothers, uh, that's the extended family of my family and I have an obligation to take care of them. So if you have a conscience and uh, these things bother you, the family members that are suffering, my family, I put them on the spot. That's an issue for me to uh, have conscience about separate. I'm talking about people that are not immediate my family. These are other people's families. Pete, there's several people in prison that may not ever come home. Hopefully they win some appeals or some considerations with these new laws and they do come home. Um, and I, I carry a lot of guilt for a guy like Ali Boy Persico, who's a great man. Jack DeRoss, Jack DeRoss was a fantastic guy. Knows the life, knew his comp, wasn't into viciousness or violences. The guy was a, a pure gentleman. And uh, when this information came out, about them with Wild Bill, I, I, I was uh, a part of a, a story, a meeting that we had, and uh, somebody gave up that meeting. It wasn't Jackie, it wasn't Allie, it wasn't me. When I cooperated, they already knew the story. And uh, no excuse there, I'm just saying they brought that story to me, and I was devastated. I never thought these guys would get pinched for this. Not that I was holding anything back, I did not. But they have families, and I know... Ali Boy's Persico's family since I'm 12 years old. I was in that house. I cut my thing, my foot in the schoolyard. His brother brought me to his house and they, they taped up my foot, my foot, put alcohol on it. I don't forget that stuff. So these are the things I carry with me, my burden. No sympathies wanted. I'm just trying to articulate what this is about. How deep, if you believe in that life, the guilt you can carry throughout life. Because I'm home. I said it was a great day to you before, right? Not a great day for those guys or their families. And that bothers me. Sometimes when I'm having a couple of drinks, I get really melancholy. I don't even know if that's the right word, melancholy. But I start thinking about certain people that I wish I was having a drink with. So uh, collateral damage. People go to prison, their family suffer. I went to prison. I didn't like it. I spent three years. I didn't like one day. So... This is collateral damage that, that bothers me. Can we, I know you're in a different place today in your life, different mindset, everything. 
But if you have the ability to go back to your mind frame in the moment. Well, I'll tell you what was it in my head. And that was revenge. Revenge, getting even. That was not part of my makeup. That I got to go to cops to get even. I got to have <laughs> these guys locked up to get even. That's not what I did my whole life. I fought my way through whatever I had to fight through or debated whatever I had to debate through. This weak moment was me breaking down after I was broken, put on the shelf with everything that was going on leading up to this. I had that weak moment. It sounds like uh, I'm making it going easy on myself. I'll say what it really was. That was a fucking punk move. Wow. And I, I, you know, I went and looked at the mirror in the bathroom afterwards, and I, I didn't like what I seen, but it was too late. And uh, that's, again, what I have to live with. So your emotions, my emotions at that time were overwhelming, distraught. I was di totally distraught. I felt, I felt betrayed. I really did. But that was, it wasn't about getting even. It was about quit. I quit. See that word, I quit? Don't exist in the mob, like I told you in the earlier video. But that's what I decided to do at that time, and it was wrong. It went to get against all my beliefs that I was taught from my, my forefathers, the way we did it, and guys in the street. Again, I didn't like rats. I just became one. Killed me. You say that you... Uh that you felt betrayed. It wasn't, at least from how I look at it, it wasn't a situation of feeling betrayed. From everything I look at, it will look like you were betrayed. Yeah, well, well again, they did. you can mount up all the excuses, but there's the end result is... No were you betrayed? Were you betrayed? Well, they, when they, 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 they put out a lie that I was robbing the family. When they tell uh, another captain, who was I called Uncle Georgie De Chico, and they tell him when he goes over there, when he hears what's going on with me, taking businesses, taking monies, et cetera, all this down the line. Don't forget, I was a man at the time. Uh, I was one time married to his niece. You know, Georgie, I'd known me since I'm a baby with the rest of those, the, the De Chicos. You know, my whole life. They hung out with my uncles. I mean, going way back. So uh, when they tell him, mind your fucking business, when he went to the administration, yeah, I got that message back. And I says, they told me mine is business. They wouldn't even talk to him about me. So these were the things I was getting more angry and more, besides everything, I was getting angry and angry and angry until I blew up. But then the blowing up became the message I got back was, you're out, you're on the shelf. And that's what led to me to just losing all the air out of my, all the steam out of me. I was fighting this case. I had multiple investigators, multiple lawyers, a scholar who knew law inside and out. Uh, we were fighting this case. So when I did this, it was a knee-jerk reaction. Not in a minute. It took days. Uh, it, it took days to do this, but that weak moment lasted too long. And it wasn't right for me to do that at that time. I should have really uh, looked in that mirror a little harder at myself before I made that decision. Now... I, I know there's no way to, to really know the answer, but what do you think caused these guys, guys you were loyal to, never did anything to, guys you worked with for a long time? I, I know there was a new administration that was in place at the time, um, and I heard you say on a previous interview that you were kind of having, uh, you know, seeing not seeing eye to eye with the uh, current administration at the time. Um, what would you say if you, you, you know, in that life, you know, in the administration, you know, in those people, why did they, why do you think from, from their thinking, they put you on the shelf? Well, I was, I was pretty well liked by a lot of families. I was a li liaison to the Colombo guys, very close with Alley Boy. And like I said, Jackie DeRoss and some, most of the other guys in that family, uh, the, uh, Tony Dux's family. Uh, Louis Daydon was acting boss at one time. He went to prison. Louis is a great guy. I was very glad. I know Louis since 16, 17 years old. Older gentleman than me. Uh, real man. Poor guy's going to die in jail. Hopefully he could get some relief also and get home. Uh, good man. I was close to a lot of these guys. Uh, so Spiro, very close to Spiro. And uh, Spiro was one of the guys who told John Jr. one time when I drove him to a meeting, when are you going to make Michael a captain? What are you waiting for? 
<laughs> sitting in front of Joe Corey and Junior. He told him directly. Uh, so I had, a, I had a pretty good base that I had built up from when I was a kid. Uh, it could be a power play. It could be jealousy, envy. I, I, you know, I really can't say what it was because I don't know. You know, they said I was robbing when I was in jail, when I, when I got locked up in the last case. I just came off a major case that everybody thought was getting convicted, including me. So I, I went to trial and I beat it. I won a miracle. So I came back. Maybe people were mad. I, I like when maybe they were mad. I beat the case. But I said, this guy's done. We don't have to deal with him no more. Because in August of that year, when I beat the case, August thirtieth, uh, I, when I came home, I, I found that there was a new administration in place, and uh, one of the positions was supposed to be mine that I refused a couple of years earlier from John Gotti uh, when he was uh, you know dying in prison. Uh, going say, yeah, which I, in hindsight, maybe I should have took that position. Maybe the world be, <laughs> you know, uh, but here we live today. So, you know, um, that part of it, I, it's really unanswered for me because I don't, I don't get it. I did everything that I could to make our family look, look good. I fought like hell with other families in a respectful way, in the right way, in the Kosher way. I went a lot, maybe I lost two beefs where I hold, my old tenure, and one of them was thrown by the boss. He got it through the match with the banana guys. Story for another day. But, um, yeah, I, I really don't have a clue why. Robbing money from Jersey, 14000 a month from a steel company, it, it, it's, it's a fabrication. No pun intended, meaning steel is fabricated. But uh, <laughs> I didn't steal, and I didn't from a steel company. And I'll, I'll make all the words into puns here, but it never happened. With small monies that were that I told the government about, nobody told me, nobody found me stealing. Small, small money here that I dispersed to other people and kept a few dollars for restaurants and stuff. That's about it. Uh, I think it just came out to a power play to get me out of the way. You know, I never met the underboss Arnold officially between when wow. I got I came home and uh, and when I got arrested in two thousand two, which is eight nine months. Never met the guy. Wow. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I really can't. It's, that's for somebody else. Maybe somebody flips one day and they say they tell the story. Now, you were arrested about what ten days or so after John Gotti passed away. Yeah, he was, he died. John died uh, June tenth, two thousand and two. I was arrested uh, June twentieth, two thousand and two. Uh, funny, uh, maybe coincidentally, that's the day my indictment. John's the day he died was unsealed. Um, and uh, 10 days later, you know, I had a lot of heat on me. I, the FBI was all over every day. Uh, I had a birthday party. I was born June 18th. So uh, we had a birthday party at uh, Sal's restaurant, Sal Romano, 333 on, uh, in Staten Island on the 19th. And I came home. We were partying, drinking all kinds of stuff, having a great time. I seen the FBI out all night. Little did I know, a couple hours later, in my drunken stupor, I was there was a knock on the door and I got arrested. And, and, and it leads me to a thought that you just kicked off some dirt, uh, rust on me just now. When I was at John's Wake, the guy was arrested already a couple of weeks. And there was a gentleman there named uh, Mikey Gal, Mikey Guerreri, his brother Tony Lee, they were with John. Uh, came up under the Faticos. Old time guy, great guy. Mikey Lee was like a guy named Kenny McCabe, an investigator. Mikey had five boroughs in New Jersey every day. He was a numbers guy, really nice guy. So I go to the wake, and uh, at some time he comes over to me. He says, uh, Hey, Michael, you're supposed to be arrested. I said, What do you mean? What do you mean, Mike? He says, You're supposed to be arrested. What do you, Mike, what do you mean you're supposed to be arrested? He says, You're supposed to be in the case. What case? Pete's case? He's already arrested. What are you talking about? He goes, I'm telling you, you're supposed to be arrested. I says, Mike, what are you doing, rooting for me to get arrested? What are you talking about? Little did I know until I got the knock on the door at 6 o'clock in the morning, which I thought was cop and they'd come do some work in, in my backyard. When I looked out, I seen the FBI. I says, they knew I was getting pinched. They never told me. They never told me directly I was getting pinched. They let it happen. Not that I was going to run away, but give me a chance to prepare. Maybe I want to hide some money. Maybe I, maybe I got guns. Maybe I want to go on the run and, and negotiate bail when I, you know, to, to come back in. I don't know. But these guys knew. And if they knew, I'm assuming, 
because this is a conversation I had. I was really mad that morning because I put it right on them that they knew. If they knew that a captain in their family or anybody in their family is going to get arrested and they didn't alert them to it, they're less than rats. Wow. They, are, You can't let that happen to anybody. You know something bad's going to happen to somebody like that in any family, you're supposed to send word out, not let it happen. Give, give your brothers an opportunity to prepare any way they can. So, again, it's an assumption, but I think it's a pretty darn good one because I got that knock on the door and I did get arrested, like he said. You're supposed, you're supposed to be arrested. What do you mean? So, Wow. Now, you get arrested, and how long until you made until you made bail or got out on bail? Well, the bail was denied. Uh, I think it was August I got the decision. We were denied bail. Okay. Which, uh, you know, for all of us, there was four of us. We all got the night bail. And we knew that was going to happen. We knew we wouldn't get bail. Even though I had probation, two probations, Atlanta and New York, say they could leave me on, on my own recon. No bail was necessary. So, uh, but the judge, I had a tough judge, one of the toughest in the country at the time. Uh, matter of fact, they called him Judge Roy Bean. So we knew we weren't getting bail. That was a foregone conclusion. Well, I, I guess, let me rephrase that. I, I, a, a point had, and if you feel comfortable talking about this, we, we don't have to talk about it if you don't want, but um, one of the things that I want to talk ask you about is w when you were on bail, my understanding was there was not uh, there was a suicide attempt. Well, I'll, 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 I'll run that by you. Okay. Uh, when I got out of bail is when I decided to cooperate. They let me come out. They wanted me to wear a wire, uh, mm -hmm. try to catch some people on tape. Uh, that, that were responsible for me getting put on the shelf and seeing the why, the reasons why. It wasn't okay. to discuss murders. It wasn't discussed that. It was for me to feel out why I was put on the shelf. Okay. So, uh, so when I'm out on bail, the first night I get home, I, I feel guilt, uh, uh, real guilt about that I'm out and these guys are still in jail and I know what I just did. Uh, I couldn't sleep. So... Um, I'd asked if I could go see a doctor and uh, get some pills that I could go to sleep because I'm not a pill guy. I don't even take an aspirin. I'm allergic to aspirin. I don't even take any pills my whole life, pain medicine and all that. I don't deal with that till today. But at this time, I knew I had to collect myself because I was super confused, super upset with myself, super depressed. And I said, I got to think my way through it. I need to sleep because leaning in jail, getting up to the bail to get out, I wasn't sleeping. I mean, I was surrounded by guys that were waiting trial, including my co-defendants. I couldn't even look at these guys in the face the right way. I had so much guilt. So when I get home, uh, you know, I'm moving around, going to see my son Michael, going to see some other people, uh, going to see my mother in the hospital at the time. I couldn't even take the friggin' wire off in the hospital talking to my mother, which was really humiliating for me. Uh, we had some really personal conversations, um, and tough, even with my son Michael. Uh, so it came one night. Um, I woke up, I had some really bad dreams and, uh, I'm walking down the stairs cause I had the pills there and, uh, I, you know, creep down and then, uh, go to the sink. I open up the, all the pills. I put them about 50 or 60, whatever the hell was there. It was a two month supply. I, as before I, I drank the wine, I said, I hope my brother, John appreciates what I'm about to do. That's why. Okay. That's why. You know, and, uh, I just want to, at that point. If it got out that I was bad or this or that, uh, maybe I could leave that legacy intact. If I took myself out of the equation and I died, I just wanted to die a good soldier at that point because that was my life. It was it was in my life, my whole life, that I, I realized what I've done. Uh, I could never turn back the clock at that point. So with everything going on, I just figured I'd I just get out of the way. I'd die like a Roman. I'd die like a samurai. You give your life for the life and... Uh, that's it. I hope the legacy could carry on in a positive way for some people. Wow. In your world, it's different than, see, in other um, types of crime, what I notice is, you know, when you cooperate, it's not something that has, you know, you can cooperate and go on about your life and it's not so much, but in your world, Everybody you know, everybody that you were born around, your family, everybody is connected to this thing. Everybody you ever know. So what I want to kind of ask you is, 
what's what's it like making that transition that jump from all you ever knew was this and now you have to leave everything that you know that process of trying to build a new life what is that like yeah uh, well first of all you don't have your name anymore uh they give you another name and uh, you know you have to lie every day because as soon as you say your name is x y and z it's not de leonardo it, you just lied so everything you wait where'd you come from what am i gonna tell them i went to new york high school in brooklyn uh what am i gonna tell them i hung out on bath avenue my whole life <laughs> you know i hung out with paul castellano's club you know, I, I know Frank Chico, he got blown up. I mean, what, what do you say? Uh, friends with Sammy Gravano since I'm uh, 12 years old. You know, <laughs> you know, you know you've got to create lies. you gotta, you got to create a lot of lies. It's, you know, I'm a, I'm a guy who's pretty much straightforward, and uh, it, w- it was a problem. And then and, and my family that was with me at the time, you know, uh, how do you tell a five-year-old uh, your name's not uh, – he knew his name, what, what it was, Anthony. He knew his name was Anthony DeLeonardo. We had to tell him uh, every time we move to a new state, we change our name. So it's 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 a process, and uh, it's hard to get de- hard to deal with. Uh, but that's what that's what it is. What are you going to do? You, you, you can the family's going to stay with you, which they did, thank God. And uh, you're going to have to just deal with it like anything else. Like, guys in prison, or the guys that their family de- members are dead, have a lot more to deal with than me worrying about my name change and all this other bullshit. So everything is relevant there's a belief that there's a lot of confidential inform, um, informants, a lot of CIs are around. How does that, how does this world exist today? How does this, how can, with the number of, well, A, I would ask you, are there a lot of CIs around? Would you agree with that? And and if there is, how does this thing continue to exist and how can this thing continue to go on? Well, there's more than ever, in my opinion, there's more guys cooperating undercover than ever. Um, and maybe it was because of the realities of guys like myself cooperating in, in mass at times, with banana guys, Colombo guys, et cetera. Uh, a lot of guys flipped. And maybe these guys got some money. Maybe they don't want their ass to touch prison. And uh, maybe the government gets a few dollars, gives them a few dollars every month, 10, 5, 15, 1,000 a month. Who knows? Yeah. And uh, that deal is a better deal than going to jail. And what they do? They give up some information about their supposed brothers, and uh, they got a veil. They got they got protection. As many people throughout history have had it. There's still many people that have not been uncovered as CIs in that life. That's been been given information. We could probably be really stunned at the people who gave information in that life. That that the people in that life or, or people that. Uh, like listen to that life, they may be shocked on some of these people who had this uh, long run. You know, there's there's people that 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 cooperate CIs. They go to prison. There's a guy named Frankie Sparacco, Colombo guy. He had murders, took a big plea, and then later on, when he was getting hit with some more charges. He flipped. It came out that he was a CI for a long time. He was close to Alley Boy. He was one of his best friends, but he, he took a big bid. He went to jail. So you, it's really hard for some people to pass out who who the CIs are. And then some of them are so obvious. I go, I scratch my head. I say, you got to be kidding me. I don't know this guy. He's that good. You know, uh, but it, I think the CIs <laughs> way outnumber the people that we know about, like myself, that flipped and cooperated. I think there's more out there. And I think the smarter people that are up there today understand that. That's why there's not the violence and the drug dealing, et cetera. Because they know sooner or later one of these guys are flipping on them. You know, they may have to be get pulled out and flip. When John was when John got arrested, John, Sammy, uh, Franklin Cassie, and Tommy Gambino that night, uh, there was high echelon. They said a hot one high echelon. No, there could have been two or three. Two or three high echelon guys who said there was only one. Yeah, yeah. Sammy don't flip. I think they pulled one of them out. I really wow. do. Uh, they didn't need Sammy for John. John convicted John uh, on tape. Uh, but what Sammy did was help them with other cases, with other families and other members of our family. But to see, get back to the CIs, there's plenty of them out there. Uh, I know a couple that were around me I just you know, that I knew pretty much. I don't want to go too far. Uh, they were out there having a good time. God bless them. Nice to have a good time. Uh, but I, I figured it out. 
So, they got this. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of this. Well, I'm sure you did. This Ron Previty guy out of Philly. He's passed on now, but I heard him talk about, you know, his process. And he, he said the FBI had gotten to a point he, that they were paying him so much money that it, it just became like he couldn't turn it down. I think they were giving him something like, I think he said, I hope I don't misquote this, but I believe he said he made over a million bucks <laughs> over time with the FBI. And I think at a time they were paying him somewhere around 10, over $10,000 a month and still allowing him, I believe, to do his little you know, nonviolent crimes and stuff. It was, it was a strange well, thing. It leads, it leads me to something, uh, another door you just opened. I Ron property was a cop, wasn't he? I yeah. Don't yeah he, was. he was a cop. We know that. Right? Yeah. So how, as a boss, as an anybody, you know, the guy's a cop. What does a cop do when he gets sworn in? When the cop gets sworn in, what does he do? Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I uphold the law and all this other nice stuff, right? They're going to arrest yeah. criminals. You took that guy in? He's a cop. So now, good question. It opens, like I said, opens another door. Question is, can a cop be a rat? <laughs> you know about the blue wall, right? Yeah. You heard about the blue wall, right? Yeah. It's the honor among cops. Yeah, but how yeah. can honor among cops when you, you take your oath? I take my oath to be criminal, right? They take their oath to arrest criminals. So if you've not got two cops, one knows about the crime the other one's doing, does that cop, the guy who's doing the crime really think the cop is not going to give him up? He, he took an oath to arrest guys like him and anybody else that kids commits a crime. So he can, he can never be a rat, even if his partner rats on him, tells on him. How do you be a rat when you know a guy took an oath to lock you up? <laughs> In my case, in our, in our life, you take an oath not to be a criminal, not to say anything about anybody. So there's that dynamic. How do you bring that guy in that life? Sally Vitale. You know, Sally Vitale's a nice guy. The guy was a hack. <laughs> you hold that from a hack. His first oath was, my first oath was when I did Blood Brother when I was a kid. You know, his first oath was to lock people up, be, be a jailer. I don't think, did Jesus say that, uh, you know, that's the only people he won't forgive is the jailers? I don't know. Maybe I'm off base with that. <laughs> but uh, look, at, look at the turnout there. So, you know, there's certain people who could be, Rats, cooperators, and, uh, you know, the army. The guy gets arrested for giving up secrets. The military, I should say, not the army. Military, yeah. give up secrets. He pledges to the, the Constitution of the United States. He pledges to that flag in our country. They call it espionage. I call it a rat. It's the same, same <laughs> thing. It's, it's, it's semantics, isn't it? Yeah. Just, you know, I would agree. So, so, uh, you know, with CIs and getting into that, I, I think the smarter guys that are in power, whoever they may be, I don't know, I'm not there, but whoever they may be are smart enough not to deal in violence and these massive amount of drugs because they know sooner or later the CI is going to tell them they're going to get an investigation on their ass and they're going to get caught. So I think I, the world has changed. Yeah. They know there's a lot of CIs. Who knows who, you, who they are? But they did it. Um, good book I read a long time ago. You probably can't see it from here, but it's Joe Bonanno's book, Man of Honor. Mm -hmm. Okay.